This is Glenn Healy. Hi, this is Braden Holpe. This is Daryl Sutter. Hi, this is Brian Burke. This is Jordan Tutu. This is Keith Morrison. This is Kelly Rudy. Hi, this is Scott Hartnell. Hey, everybody. My name is Steel Fleury. This is Tim McAuliffe of Sportsnet, and you're listening to the Sean Newman Podcast. Welcome to the podcast, folks. Happy Sunday. You know, that feels a little weird, doesn't it? A little Sunday fun day today. Um, not too many times do we l- release an episode on a Sunday, but uh, if you missed Thursday night, we had a grand old time at 4th Meridian, a little pint and a uh, slice of pizza, raising money for this bike for breakfast that happens on June 4th to 6th. Uh, it was a great night. Kids played, music sang. I, I can't remember the last time I heard live music. It's Well, it's probably been over a year. And uh, just seeing some people smiling and having a good time, I really, really hope uh, more of that is coming soon for all of us. Um, now with today's episode, we got a, we got a cool one in store for you, but before we get there, maybe we should get to today's episode sponsors, Jen Gilbert and the team for over 45 years since 1976, the dedicated realtors of Coldwell Banker Cityside Realty have served Lloydminster and the surrounding area. Now I'm all about supporting, uh, some cool initiatives here in Lloydminster and that is why we fit so well together, myself and Coldwell Banker. They are, uh, teaming up with Big Sisters, uh, Big Brothers and Big Sisters for 50 minutes for 50 years. Uh, that's Tuesday, May 18th, so that's coming up awfully quick. If you visit Coldwell Bank or Cityside Realty between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m., did they can take donations uh, with their team. I would suggest going to uh, their page to find out all the uh, 50 minutes for 50 years for Big Brothers and Big Sisters. That is Coldwell Banker, Cityside Realty. For everything real estate, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, give them a call, 780-875-3343. Jim Spenrath and the team over at Three Trees Tap and Kitchen. Of course, I've been mentioning, if you follow them on social media, they're giving away gift cards to one lucky follower every single week. And how can you go wrong if you're looking for a growler of beer? Anything they got on tap, uh, you can get filled in one of their... Um, newly branded uh, Three Trees Growlers. Now, that's Ribstone. That's what I was drinking a couple nights ago, a little Fourth Meridian. But, I mean, honestly, Guinness, a whole list of different uh, beverages you can toss on tap. So do one other thing for yourself. Uh, with these limited seating capacities, make sure you call and make a reservation because Three Trees is always jarred. Um, well, with the limited space, that is. Give them a call, 780 874 Two five. Crude Master Transport. Since 2006, Crude Master has been an integral part of our community. They're a leader in the oil and gas. Um, and of course, you know, it's funny. I always, uh, you know, with the Crude Master Final Five on so many of the podcasts, um, Heath and Tracy never cease to amaze me. You know, with our group, June, June 4th, biking from Lloyd uh, to Tufnell, raising br- uh, money for breakfast programs in our community. Uh, and, and that's Lloyd Catholic, Northwest, Buffalo Trail, Onion Lake School Divisions. Uh, Heath and Tracy get are, are got right behind it, and family for that matter. So shout out to Spencer, who I talked to uh, throughout it, and they donated twenty five thousand dollars. That's why I love highlighting and, and being a part, or having them be a part of what I do. Is they just uh, they're always community first, and it's it's really cool to um, just see firsthand how they support our community. So shout out to Ethan Tracy and uh, the family over at Crude Master Transport. HSI Group, they are the local oil field burners and combustion experts that can make uh, sure you have a compliant system working for you. The team also offers security, surveillance, and automation products for residential, commercial, livestock, and agricultural applications. They use technology to give you peace of mind so you can focus on the things that truly matter. So stop on in today, 3902 52nd Street, or give Brody or Kim a call at 306-825-6310. And the boys from T-Bar 1 Transport, who uh, a couple of them will be on the podcast tomorrow for another brother Newman Brothers Roundtable. Since 2002, for more than 19 years, the team at T-Bar has offered excellent service, putting the communities first. Uh, they are located in Lloyd Minster and both, oh, and Bonneville. They can cover all your heavy haul needs. In their fleet, they have tank movers, 45-ton pickers, one-tons, flat decks, Texas bed, winch truck, highway tractors, and uh, they're all over the place. I passed them. I'm always out east, you know, around North Battleford, and they were out there with uh, what looked like a load of pipe. Um, but they're 
anything you need, heavy haul, give the boys at T-Bar a call, 780-205-1709. Um, if you're looking for any outdoor signage, I highly suggest Read and Write and the talented Mrs. Deanna Wandler here in Lloydminster. And finally, Gartner Management is a Lloydminster-based company specializing in all types of rental properties to help meet your needs, whether you're looking for a small office or a 6,000-square-foot commercial space. Uh, give Mr. Wade Gartner a call, 780-808-5025. All right, if you're heading into any of these businesses, make sure you let them know you heard about them from the podcast. Now let's get on to that T-Bar 1 tale of the tape. Inventor, business owner, community pillar. I'm talking about Wayne King. So buckle up, here we go. skating in the winter time and and uh and i always invite them into my man cave and we all have hot dogs and cookies for the you know for the school uh function that that either bill armstrong or ross richards or someone has been or morgan man has been involved with and uh, uh and the and the man cave is, is a highlight it really is it's and i spend lots of time out here it's a great place to to enjoy um uh your your efforts your hobby efforts or it's a great in place even to just just get your mind straightened out and uh and, and i every man every man should have a man cave that he can he can hide out in well i'm glad your name didn't come across my plate like two months ago because the the wood fire burning right now this is this is perfect like it, it doesn't get much better <laughs> yeah. than this no it doesn't and i i have my wood stove going all the time my my uh my forced air furnace barely cuts in so so it's great well Here's where I normally start at the beginning, and we're going to get there, but now all I can think of is you stopped drinking, you stopped coffee on the same day. Right. The co- I think the drinking, most people would go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, alcohol, all right. Yeah, but- and I never did have, well, well, I shouldn't say I never had a drinking problem. I, I was never, you know, got in serious trouble by drinking too much. I was very heavily involved in sports when I was young. Okay. And, uh, and right up, Right up to not even young, back you know when I was middle age, I was still heavily involved in sports, and it was sports that kept me in school. It was sports that uh, that uh, kept me involved with with you know groups of of, of school kids, and and after school was over, uh, it had me involved in weekend events and so on. It was baseball and fastball and uh, and broom ball and some hockey and so on. I played sports won many awards for sports and so on but uh it was it was really the uh the uh the friendships and the social events that that I very much enjoyed in in sports and and uh, so going back to the to the alcohol we when you're in sports you uh, tend to have a lot of beer drinking days and and uh, you know social activities i can remember one time in my fastball days we would we would uh, we had a, a uh, had our fastball team called uh, the, the Husky Oilers and the and the Colts, and we would go to a ball tournament up in Dorntosh, for an example. We would all ride the school bus. We had a school bus converted. We'd all pile in this bus and get the Dorntosh. Well, by the time we got there, and this is when I, when I was 20 years old, by the time we got there, we had drank too much, and it was late in the evening. We would park the bus on the ball diamond up in Dorntosh so it's that the tournament couldn't start without waking us up and having us move the bus. <laughs> it was good strategy at the time, it seemed like. <laughs> so, and I was always, I was always in charge of, uh, of lining up the tournaments and uh, uh, making sure everybody was, was, you know, was present for the tournaments, and I was the go-to guy. All, it seemed like always, whether it be broom ball or whether it be fastball, it was, it was me that was... Uh, had a lot to do with organizing of, of the teams. And, uh, uh, yeah, so so anyway, sporting events was a big part of my life. Why coffee, though? Why, why no coffee? Well, coffee is funny. I, I would get up in the morning, you know, and I've been an early riser all my life, first out of bed always, and, and I'm talking five, 5 o'clock in the morning, 
you would, you know, or 5.30, you would, you would put on the coffee pot, you'd climb into the shower, you'd get out of the shower, have a, have a cup of coffee. And then because I, I typically have lived out of town, or even when I was in town, my shop was outside of town, I would have another coffee on the road to work. I'd stop and pick up a newspaper and buy a coffee. And then get to the office, have another coffee while you're reading the newspaper. And then it just, it, and it was, it was cream and sugar. And one day I said to myself, you know what, this is just a habit is, is all it is. And, and uh, same as drinking alcohol was just a habit. You know, you'd have people over, we couldn't have a social event without having beer involved. And so I just said, you know what, it's, you know, I'm getting older, I, it's harder on my health. And I just one day said, you know what, I'm just going to quit. So I quit both of them the same day. And, and, and really, I thought I would struggle because I drank alcohol the greatest part of my life. And it was, it was nothing. Once my mind was made up, I just quit. And I haven't had, and honestly, I haven't, I haven't had a drink of alcohol in over 12 years. Good just, for you. Yeah, just one of those things. But you know, you know what? I also find that I've got a lot more money in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's, and, and, oh, and I, I'm a smoking Nazi. When I had my companies, I, I would, the, the smokers, I would go up to them and said, you know, how, how long have you smoked and how much do you smoke? And I says, you know what, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you $2 an hour extra if you quit smoking. And, and some, some people did. And, and, and even to this day, I, I will, they'll, I'll be, buying gasoline at the service station and there'll be somebody in front of me will buy a pack of cigarettes or a, or a can of chewing tobacco and I will get quite verbal as to why are you doing this? How much money do you make an hour? This is costing you, one pack of smokes is costing you an hour and a half worth of labor. I said, you can't afford to continue smoking and I'm a smoking Nazi and I always have been. My mom never, my, my mom and dad both smoked and when I got my driver's license, my mom would ask me if I'd go to buy her a pack of cigarettes when I was in town. I would refuse. I said, sorry, mom, I'm not buying you cigarettes. And I would never buy her cigarettes. <laughs> but that's just the way it is. I've never been, and I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. It's just, and I think back as to how much big picture, long term, how much money have I saved in my life by not smoking? by not smoking cigarettes, aside from my health, but how much money have I saved in my life by not smoking cigarettes? Huge amount from comparative to some people that smoke a pack or more a day, you know, so. I can't. Pack a day would be a lot. Oh, yeah, but there's people do it. Lots of people smoke a pack a day. Yeah. Well, let's go back uh, now that you've answered that for me because as soon as you said coffee, I just, I enjoy coffee. Yeah. Coffee's part of the morning yeah. Uh, habit, morning routine, morning well, whatever. Well, I, 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 I go for coffee in the mornings um, and have for a long time. When I had my company was going, I would have, you know, I would have coffee in the morning. I was always first at the office. Yeah. And, and so what do you have in its place now? Water. You just have a glass just, of water. Yeah, have water, a bottle of water or a glass of water. Yep. That's what I have. And, and I try to have, I try to have two bottles of water uh, every, every morning, you know, so, so as it, to get your liquid, you know, amounts up. Did you notice that you felt better after you? Obviously, the alcohol would be easy. I mean, yeah, I, to be quite frank, I haven't noticed a big difference on on my health. To be honest with you, whether it made a big difference on my health or not, I'm not sure. But, uh, but I, but but I do know that uh, that it was a once my mind was made up, it was an easy thing to do to quit quit both, actually. Well, let's go back then to uh, your childhood. We always usually start with you know like what's maybe one of your earliest memories you mentioned um growing up with a family with uh six boys one girl like back in the well that would have been the early early 50s that was in the early 50s um the, the way my family uh evolved was that that my my dad was was married prior to him marrying my mother so so my my, my dad married his first wife they had one child and she passed away of of, uh, of tuberculosis, and then he married her sister. She passed away. So by the by, nineteen fifty, say, my, my my dad was batching and uh, and uh, living by himself on the farm with three boys, and and he, he married my mother in uh, I believe it was forty nine. He married my mother, and uh, and she came on scene. Well, my my dad was was a farmer, and 
uh, not not educated, so he had to work on the farm. And uh, uh, we had we had uh, we got that work ethic because we were born and raised in the farm. We started we started young. I mean, I remember as just you know four years old, my job was to come home uh, or, or you know come out you know, out to the farmyard and cut firewood, for example. Every every day, I had to cut kindling. So mother had kindling to start the wood stove in the morning. That's all we had was a wood stove and, uh, and uh, uh, on, on the farm. We didn't have running water. We, uh, we, it, it was, it was, it was a, a normal life at the time, but, but we had tasks. I mean, gardening, we grew our own vegetables and, and we, we, uh, we cut our own firewood. And firewood, uh, when Lord Minster area was first settled, there was no firewood locally here because the prairie fires killed all the trees. We had to go north of the river to get firewood. Now that was before my time, but uh, uh, when, you know, so we would we would have our, our, our pile of trees and it would be my job when I was young, four and five and six years old to to cut firewood, get kindling in place. And in the winter time, we didn't have running water. In the winter time, we'd have a, have a barrel beside the kitchen stove. And it was my job as well to fill that barrel full of snow. That was our source of water. That we this, the wood stove would heat the, the snow up. We we would have a barrel of water, and to do dishes with and so on. And uh, as far as bathing and stuff, we we didn't have that. It, it was it was all just a just a hand basin and and a washcloth. That was it when we were young. And uh, and uh, my 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 dad, you know, I always wanted a horse when I was young. And my my dad, we we had livestock. But he would never buy me a horse, and and uh, and and I and I would ask my dad. He says, "Dad, he says, our you know, our our neighbor kids they have a horse. Would you buy us a horse so we can go riding with them?" No, no, I'm not. I'm I'm not going to buy you a horse. He says, "I will never buy you anything that eats," and so he wouldn't buy me a horse. But when I was ten years old, though, or maybe eleven, he bought he bought me a motorbike rather than a horse, and uh, so we never had horses on our farm at all. We did have livestock, but no horses. And uh, and we had to walk to the school bus. Did you ever? Did you pick his brain on that then? Uh, no, that's just the way it was. I accepted the fact that that uh, he horses were expensive. They were they were you know just un, un really unnecessary. They were, but uh, no, he he never he, we never had any horses on on the farm at all. And because uh, just he he thought they were unnecessary. And another mouth to feed. Another mouth to feed. Yeah, and vet bills and. And he's, they were expensive, so we never never had any horses. And then, and then as time went on, uh, you know, when I was to start grade one in school, the the old Westdean Country School was still active, and and but it was going to shut down, and all those kids were going to get school bused into Lloydminster. So my mother held me out of school for the first year, so that I didn't start school in the old Country School. I started school in Lloydminster in the Winston Churchill School in Lloydminster is where I started grade one and uh and then after school you'd get home on the bus we had to walk half a mile through the bus every day uh and then uh, at night we'd walk back home and then uh the chores would kick in cut firewood shovel snow and uh and uh, help out around the farm you know that that's what our life was so so I've, I've i've had that work ethic drilled into me uh all my life and uh and uh i've I've been accused of many times of, of, of uh, doing too much or, or um, uh, you know, not, not sitting back and letting time lapse. As, but if, if there's a project that needed to be done, then it needed to be done and I would jump in and do it. I was always leading the charge. So, so uh, schooling was never, was, was never a big event on me academically. Although I I did, you know, make it through through to grade twelve, but schooling was important to me because of sports. I was always very interested and excited in sports, uh, track and field. Um, I uh, I always did very well in track and field. Um, did very well in in the school sports uh, and so on, but uh, and it was more important. That's what kept me in school was 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 the sporting events of school. I uh, in. In school, I went to. I played football. I I, I went to track and field events. I uh, 
I, I won first place ribbons in the Alberta track and field provincials. Um, I broke a record in, uh, in pole vault in Calgary uh, in, in when I was in high school. Won first place, of course, and, uh, and that's, what, that's what kept me in school. And actually, I went back an extra six months in school just so I could play football. It, it was that important to me. <laughs> I took a first semester. So I, I intentionally failed one, one, grade, or one uh, subject so as I could go back to school in the fall so I could play football. That was, and don't tell my mother that, but, but. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so. What, that, what uh, after you graduate then, you talk about traveling the world. Mm-hmm. What was it that enticed you to get away from this area and, well, and, and go see some things? I was, I was a young fellow, of course, and I had no ties. My, uh, my, my dad didn't need help. Our farm was not a big farm. And, uh, and so I, I went to work. I had an opportunity to go to work on a, well, w- I should go back. When I was in high school, I always worked. I, I worked pumping gas, for an example. And I, when I was old enough to get my driver's license when I was 16 years old, I delivered dry cleaning for a local dry cleaning uh, facility, Miguel's Dry Cleaning. And I pumped gas. And so I was always a worker. And, and when I got out of high school, I said, you know, I said, what am I going to do with myself now? And I asked my dad, I said, Dad, what should I do? Now that I'm out of school, you know, I didn't have any intention to go to university because that wasn't in our family. It was, uh, we were workers. And, and well, son, he says, he says, I farmed all my life. He says, it's been a good life. He says, but as you see, I don't have a lot to show for it. He says, my recommendation to you, he says, don't be a farmer and don't ever buy anything that eats. That was his recommendation to me. So then I said to myself, well, geez, what am I going to do? So I, I, I went out. At the time, there was a lot of petroleum ministry activity. I went and worked on the drilling rig, uh, just helping out on the drilling rig, got a little bit of experience. Then I had an opportunity, went into the high Arctic. Uh, uh, in the high Arctic, that was before uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau and the National Energy Program was in place. We were drilling for oil up in the high Arctic. We would fly into Yellowknife and then fly by smaller uh, plane, Twin Otter type plane into Resolute Bay, for an example. And, and up into Ellesmere Island and, and further north even, living in tents and uh, uh, while we're on the, on the rigs. And uh, that was a g- great experience. A- actually living in tents? Living in tents, yeah. Yeah, yeah, park all tents. That's, that's, what, that's what we lived in when we were on camp, in camp up in the high Arctic at, at the time. When you- <laughs> yeah, so, so, so we, would, we would move the drilling rigs, uh, you know, move the drilling rigs, and then, and then the, tent, or the camp was, was tents was park called tents and and so uh, that was a good experience when you look back at that experience what, what's the things that stick out about being on those early drilling rigs camping um, in tents around the yeah well i i look back at it as a wonderful experience um it, it, it wasn't i mean you're living in tents yes and it's cold yes but uh i mean you had all the amenities and uh and and uh, it was you know the the biggest event was getting in and out you know because the the runway for the airplanes was was, was just a piece of tundra, and uh, and uh, it was risky business flying in and out, and uh, I I can remember one time, uh, you would leave Yellowknife in a twin otter airplane. There there'd be 12, 12 people and 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 their baggage and some supplies would fly in, and there was a crosswind that day, and uh, and I can remember circling the runway. There's a crosswind so strong that we couldn't land. But we didn't have enough fuel to get back to Yellowknife, and so we had to land. And so this pilot, I can remember looking out the window, scared, like very scared, and looking out the window, and we're coming in crossways on the runway. He hit the snowbank before the runway, crashed into the snowbank, which slowed us down. He hit the runway, reversed the prop, skidded into the on the opposite side of the runway into the snowbank on the opposite side of the runway, and then we had to get out. We, we stopped safely, we got out. We had to shovel the airplane out of the snowbank on the far side of the runway. The crew was there. That was, it was, it was a crew change, so the crew was there to help that was going out. We pushed the plane back into the runway where we just shoveled out, and they took off crossways on the runway the same way they landed. And this is 400 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Had, they, had there been a wreck? And it, nobody ain't coming out Nobody's save coming you. out of there. No, no, that's right. Did that? Did, did you go? You <laughs> well, know, maybe this is my last. Yeah. In here? Well, it was an experience, that's for sure. 
And then, and and then. Uh, so did you stay longer then? Wait a second. You can't hop off of this. You're just talking about smashing the plane into. Yeah. Can you imagine being the guy coming off shift going, oh boy. Yeah. Well, that was that was just that was piece of piece of the job at at the time. That's what you needed to do, to to, to make it work. And then. And then we finished that project. Spring came. We finished you, that project. Um, uh, we 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 received. I was in, uh, at the time. We had to unload some ships coming in, um, and so I was I was one of the workers on shore unloading barges. Uh, we had to unload fuel because all the diesel fuel had to come up. We'd store it in in uh, in uh, uh, a big big bladders that we used to call them bladders. So fuel bladders. They were the size of a. Uh, Maybe maybe a 200 or 300 feet long and 60 or 80 feet wide, filled full of diesel fuel. That was no no secondary containment, no spill protection, no nothing up there at the time. But that's 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 what we did. I was in charge of unloading fuel at the time from the ships, and uh, and uh, and that was part of the job. And then so with that experience, I felt pretty comfortable and I had a little bit of money. So at that point in time, I decided that that I'm going to. I had nothing to hold me in Lloydminster. I thought well, I'm going to travel the world and, and, and let's take a look at what else is out there. So a couple of my local buddies here, uh, Larry Olenek and Ron Gunn, we uh, bought a one-way ticket to uh, Sydney, Australia, jumped on, uh, jumped on a ship in Vancouver, went by ship from Vancouver to Hawaii to Fiji, and we had a friend in New Zealand we were going to visit, and, uh, which was all good. We got to New Zealand. It was a great trip on the way down. And New Zealand, I got bored from sitting around, and so I left my buddies in New Zealand and went hitchhiking. And I got up, I got from New Zealand to Australia by myself, and then from Australia. Were I, those were those first days a little bit uh, nerve wracking, or did I, you enjoy? Yeah, it? no, I enjoyed it, but but I was fearless. Looking back, I was fearless. Like I, I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know what was driving me to to do this. But I, I just, I just headed out. I just couldn't sit around, you know, and uh, and I wanted to see more, more of the world. So I got to Sydney, and I, I had sixty dollars left in my pocket. I, I got to Sydney with sixty dollars, and I, and and I had long hair and a pack sack. That's all I had, sixty bucks. And uh, I thought, well, I got to see Australia. So I started hitchhiking from Sydney. I hitchhiked all the way across the Nullarbor Plain. And uh, I didn't have enough money, of course. The Australians were very kind. They uh, they would feed me at times. They would give me a place to sleep at times. Lots of times I slept in the ditches, though. And, uh, and, uh, slept in the ditches? Yeah. Well, all I had was a pack sack and no money and no friends. I had no I, no family, no friends, no nothing over there. And so I just, so I slept, did whatever I had to do. So I slept in the ditches. And but then, as you're sitting in the ditches, aren't you thinking like, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course I was, but it it was you an adventure, you know. I mean, it, it was an adventure. So so anyway, hitchhiked all the way across the Nullarbor Plain. I know, but I got to stop you right there. So you're sleeping in ditches. Yeah, you know, like Australia's got some of the yeah. most venomous snakes yeah, absolutely in the bloody world sitting there. Yeah, no question about it. Out on the Nullarbor Plain, it, it was quite dangerous actually. So why aren't you just okay? I'm broke. I got. Why aren't you? Why are you well, still searching for what? What my goal was, was was I heard there was there was petroleum drilling happening in Perth, and so so because I had some drilling rig experience, I thought to myself, well, let's get to Perth and maybe I can get a job there. So that was that's what drove me on to get across an all of our plane to Perth, which is on the western side of Australia. But this is you know for kids that ever listen to this, this is different than flicking your iPhone on and going, "There's a drilling rig sitting in Perth." Oh, oh yeah, you're going off of the words of a few people that's, going, "I think there's a drilling this rig." Is, in Perth. This is before the iPhone era, that's for sure. And uh, and and there there you know that that was Australia's just in in word in in hearsay there was there was a, a petroleum activity on the west side of Australia. So I hitchhiked. I got to Australia or to the west side of Australia. I was flat broke. I had spent all my sixty dollars getting across the desert, and uh, I was flat broke. Had no money, and uh, uh, there, there, there was like homeless men shelters there, and so I was able to get fed at least in in Perth, and then I went around and applied in different drilling rig companies, and and I got a job. Actually, I got a job when I was in Perth on an offshore drilling rig that was located in between Tasmania and Australia. 
and uh, so I had to get to to uh, to uh, uh, Melbourne, and uh, uh, and so I, and and then from there you would catch the, the the helicopter from there out into to the drilling rig, and I got there, I got out, I got in the helicopter, we flew out to the drilling rig, and at that point in time I had to work for free just for room and board. You know, I was a des- I was d- desperate really yeah. at, at that time. And I was making, they, they paid me $1.37 an hour on an offshore drilling rig at the time. And uh, and it was all, they stayed right on the rig. And it was three weeks on the rig and one week off. And the week off in Australia, I was able, they would fly me anywhere in Australia that I wanted to go for that week off. So it was it was a match made in heaven. I got to see Australia and I had a job. Eh? So, so so I worked that drilling rig and uh, and ended up getting having a little bit of money. And and uh, time was a ticking, so how, I needed. How, how long did you work on the drilling? Uh, rig? I, I worked in the drilling rig about seven months. Yeah, so so I worked on there a fair bit, not not a not not years, but but enough, you know. And I thought to myself, well, I got a little bit of money, and I I gave my notice. I left the drilling rig, and I hitchhiked up from Perth. Before before, yeah. before we go any further. Uh, are you sending letters back? Do your yes. buddies know you're alive? To... Actually, actually, I kept a diary every day that, that, that I was gone. And I've got the diary. I still have that diary. Really? Yeah. Every day. Every day I made notes in that diary as to what I was doing, where I was sleeping, the people I met, and, and so on. And I still have that diary. When was the last time you read through that? Uh, I haven't read it all for years, but 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 I thumbed through it here not, not that long ago. Actually, it's right in that little filing cabinet right there. And, and what's maybe one of the... Cri- Can I see it? Yeah, sure. actually, yeah, so, yeah. You want me to do it right I, now? I do. Yeah. There it is. There, there it is. So there's. You don't mind if I take a look? No. Well, for a guy that didn't like school, your handwriting sure is nice. So what do you see in there? It says <clears throat> caught the plane at seven twenty-seven a.m. from Perth to. Somewhere starts with an A. Uh, landed in Accolade, does that sound or something like that? At six thirty a.m. Oh, so it must have not. Been, it caught a seven twenty-seven at two a.m. Actually, smaller two motor <laughs> waiting at the airplane for us. There wasn't enough room for all of my or for all of us, so I sat in the cockpit along with the with the pilot. And 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 the reason that that we, that we had to land there. Was they wouldn't let anybody into Singapore with long hair, and uh, and so we had to I had to get off the airplane and catch a bus to 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 get into into Malaysia. Just to a random question about writing: Did writing help you? Was it a, was it uh, at all therapeutic? To, especially when you're sleeping in ditches and just kind of. Yeah, well, I, I I did it faithfully, you know. I I kept my diary faithfully, and so it must have been doing something positive, you know. And yeah. and 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 I don't know when I look back, I glance back through it now. This is 1972, yeah. You know, and uh, and so I glance back through it now. That was that was uh, 50 years ago. Yeah. You know, or you know, so a glimpse it, into literally yeah, yeah. where you were. You know, the past. Yeah. You know, and uh, and so yeah, you know, it's. Uh, and uh, so, so, so anyway, to carry on, I, I got to Singapore and I went. In why, di- why did you pick Singapore? <coughs> well, I wanted, I, I, I was going to continue hitchhiking. And I had a brother at the time that was, that was in, uh, that was in Bahrain. And so I thought, well, I, I would get into Singapore and, uh, and then try to catch a plane, uh, you know, and, and so on and see how far I could hitchhike and see, just to see more country. You know, I was hitchhiking, see more country. And uh, and so I got into uh, into Singapore and uh, in through Malaysia and saw that part of the world and 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 then what what sticks when you look back at those days what sticks out you know about Malaysia Singapore oh the the uh, the crowds the the people the you know the the uh, it was just it was just something that that I had to see. And I, I didn't have any intention on staying there for long. I was just kind of traveling through, yeah. and uh, and I was on a world tour, so I wanted to see as much as I could. And uh, uh, you know, of course, um, financially I wasn't real great, 
you know, even even though I'd worked the rigs, you know, for, for quite a few months, I still wasn't great financially. And uh, so I had to watch. But and my goal, you know, but by this time, my goal was to kind of start heading toward home. Um, and, uh, you know, so I was I was heading. I was in the far side of the world. I needed to get back home. So I was my intention was to go from Malaysia, Jakarta, was to get to the Middle East to visit my brother for a bit and then get to England and uh, and and get home from there so anyway the way it worked out was that i got to malaysia jakarta did a tour around there and when i checked the flights i flew over my brother i didn't stop to see him so i i flew direct, directly to england and uh, because i was starting to get you know realization was i needed to do something with my life and i needed to enough of the the touring i needed to what, get back home to get to work what was the moment that you started to go okay it's time i start pulling myself to get well, well well i was by myself too you know i didn't have no friends and i was i was out there by myself and and i think you know the hitchhiking across australia and getting up into singapore and so on and then uh, i think realization come that i needed to get to work you know and do something with my life enough for this you know, sitting around. But it wasn't, it wasn't a conversation. But, it wasn't. No, I can uh, not. Not that I can remember. No, no. There's no one one instant that's that was that was. Uh, I I can uh, when I flash back, I can I can remember some of the girls that I met and uh, and uh, you know some of the and I had a girlfriend back home that I a high school sweetheart kind of thing and uh, and I just realization came that I needed to get back home and and so that's what I did. I flew to London. And uh, stayed in England for, for, I can't remember how long, a few weeks. Uh, I was pretty much flat broke again, sleeping in Hyde Park, uh, uh, in, 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 in the bushes in Hyde Park with a pack sack. And uh, I finally I had enough. I, I phoned my dad in Lloydminster. I said, Dad, I'm broke. I need money to get back home. And so he sent me enough money to, uh, or wired me enough money to get me a one-way ticket from London, England to Montreal. And then I got to Montreal, and I hitchhiked home from Montreal to Lloydminster. Flat broke, and uh, and realizing I needed to do something with my life. And so so from that point on... I'm going to yeah. stop you right okay. there. Broke? Broke. <laughs> hitchhiking from Montreal across. You remember what time of year that was? I know I can't. And that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, no, I can't remember what time I just, of year that was. You know, and I, I where we're sitting... Right, like the time we're sitting in with um, being warm, belly full, <laughs> smile on our faces. Life is good. <laughs> life is good, right? Yep. Life is good. I mean, but we're living in some interesting, yep, interesting yep. times right now. I can't speak for everybody. Yep. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's well, lots of people that oh, are hurting. Oh, big time. You bet there is. But And it's not over. No, it, it certainly is not over. No. I just, to willingly become broke... <laughs> To the point where you're hitchhiking across our country, yeah, it's just it's it's very interesting yeah, to me. It's yeah. intriguing, well, and it seems it was like a, it was a life experience. You know, I mean, it was it was a life experience, and that's what given me the drive. All these years, the last fifty years, it's been it's given me the drive to work hard, to do your best, to accomplish things that are extra extraordinary, and uh, and make the best out of life. And that that's what I've done. That that drove me on to 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 do that. You know, and that's, and that's what I'm still doing to this day, for God's sake. I'm still working hard, and <laughs> this summer I'll I'll take you for a tour around here later. I'll do all the stuff I did this summer, it's just I'm I'm a workaholic, is is, is what it is. Yeah, you enjoy it. Yeah. Oh yeah, I enjoy it absolutely. Yeah. But uh, so so anyway, just to carry on. What when I got back from Montreal to Lloydminster, then I decided I said to myself, "Geez, I got to do something with my life. What am I going to do?" And uh, and I was always interested in furniture and furniture upholstery. And uh, I said to myself, you know, you know, I'm done. You know, I was painting houses a little bit from time to time. And, and uh, you know, uh, you know and I, I said, I got to get a trade. So I went, I had no money, of course. I went to Canada Manpower. I, I, I went to Canada Manpower and asked them if, if they would sponsor me for a trade. And they, they said yes. And, and I said, well, I, I want to become a furniture upholsterer, get a trade. And we looked, and the only place that they offered furniture upholstery as a trade was in the Weyburn Mental Institution. And so, so the uh, Canada Manpower sponsored me, 
and, and I you went, went to and the I went Weyburn to, to Weyburn to the Weyburn Mental Institution, and I moved and I the trade started in September, and uh, so I went down had no money. I slept in the park in a tent until until the weather got so cold that I couldn't sleep in the tent any longer, and then I got an apartment, and at the same time, uh, in October, I got married. So I got married on October the sixth, nineteen seventy three. And, uh, and so I was living in the tent. When I got married, I got an apartment and finished off my, my course in Weyburn. In, uh, in You're bringing up so many... Okay, wait. Were you living in a tent when you got married? I was living in a tent, but I knew when I got married, I had to get an apartment. So I moved out of the tent <laughs> was your wife, and was had your, an apartment. <laughs> was your fiancé with you in the tent? No. No, living she, in was Lloyd. Still, she was still in Lloyd. Yeah. You literally have lived from the meagerest of meager. No question about it. Right? Like, it, yeah. not a well, pot to pissing no, comes, to, comes even, to mind. I mean, even when we're on the farm, we, we had no money. You know, and so I was used to having no money. You know, we, we were not a wealthy family. We were, we were, we were workers. And, and that's the reality of it. And so it didn't, it didn't shock me that I was living in a tent. You know, it was just what I do, what I had to do. To, to, to make it work. And I obligated, you know, Canada Manpower, I obligated them. I told them I was going to get this trade and they sponsored me. So I, that's what I had to do was get right. this trade. Right. And, and, and so I got and, the trade. So, so then the next question I have is what it, was it about upholstery? Like, was that a, was that an, a big thing back in the No, the 70s I don't know. Or? It just kind of interested me. More automotive car fancy car type upholstery than, oh, than furniture. Okay. Okay. But, but the only course that was available was, was furniture. And, uh, and, and so I went and, and took a furniture, learning how to sew, learning how to stitch and thread and, uh, and uh, you, know, you know, tailor, uh, you know, living room furniture kind of thing. And, uh, and so then once I was done that course, um, and there was some furniture refinishing was involved in this as well and, and so on. So then I, I was able to get a job uh, in Prince Albert and moved to Prince Albert right from Weyburn straight to Prince Albert, got a job there, and w which was good. I was the, I was the guy uh, in, this, in this furniture store. I was the upholsterer, but I was not there for too long, only, only about six or eight months. I decided that, that I'm going to move back to Lloydminster and I'm going to start a furniture upholstery store. So that's what I did. I came back to Lloydminster and took on Larry Olenek as a partner, and we started the furniture clinic in uh, in 1974. Started the furniture clinic. And People can't see me right now, but this is like, this is very, like, this is, I don't know what it is about furniture that, that just today, today's age, would you ever think of starting a furniture clinic? <laughs> no. Right? No. It just seems. No, but it was, it was something to do and it's something I enjoyed. And, uh, and I'd, I'd gone to school to get some training, so I needed yeah. to do something yeah, with yeah, that. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, all, the, all that and, makes and, sense. And uh, we did, and the furniture clinic did pretty good. But I only stayed in the furniture clinic for five years. Um, uh, the reason being is that the bulk, and, and this is not a slur to, 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 the, to the female population, but, but it was dealing with, with ladies all, all the time. And, uh, and, and I was more of a rigor, you know, type, rough blue and tough collar. type blue yeah. collar type yeah. of guy and i i i did it for five years and then i decided that i needed to move on to other other bigger better adventures more yeah. maybe more opportunities yeah. that, that are out there yeah so 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 i sold out to larry olenic and uh larry olenic just he operated that store for for many many years that you're you're well aware of and uh and i kept and we're still good. We're still best of friends. You know, even after all these years, we're still best of friends. And, uh, and I went on and got into the sales. Well, actually, I got into building radio communication towers is, is, is what I did from the furniture clinic. I didn't know anything about radio towers, but, but an old neighbor on the farm, he, was, he, he got into the radio communication business. That was just when they were introducing the transition from CB radio, uh, which, which is just a broadband uh, open type radio system to VHF radio, which is very high frequency radio and private channels. 
and and that was before cell phones that was before any mobile communications it was just at the advent of mobile communications was was coming in in so i saw a future there so i i went and saw my neighbor who was his name was bill till and he was getting into the radio communication business because he was a ham operator he was familiar with radio communications and uh, he said, well, Wayne, he says, I said, yeah, Bill, I'm, I'm looking for work, looking for a career path. He says, well, he says, how are you at building radio towers? And I says, I don't know. I've never built a radio communication tower before. Well, he says, I've got some antennas to put up and let's see how you like it. So I said, okay. He, said, he says, are you scared of heights? I says, no, I'm not scared of heights. I would work on, this, on the drilling rig up, up the rig and so on. I said, no, I'm not scared of heights. Okay, well, Let's get started. So, we, so I, I went to work for Bill Till at Till Communications doing radio antenna installations on tall towers. So you would climb up the 200-footer or 300-foot tower with a rope tied to your belt and then a, and a pulley. You get up to the top, you'd put the pulley on and then send the rope down and then, and then another fellow would tie the antenna on. You would rope the antenna up to the top of the tower. You would affix the antenna, run the feed line down the tower, and then that would be your your antenna for the radio communication, and uh, I, I did that, and then I built towers around. Right, well, I moved from antennas to building towers, and I never built towers before. I had no instruction, no training. If Bill would just said, "Wayne," he says, "We got a tower to build. It's 250 feet tall on top of Mount Joy. Go out and build this tower. You got to put in. You got to do the concrete work first. You got to drill, uh, you know, dig a hole, fill it full of concrete, put in the anchors, and so on." So I did all that. And then and built towers, and I built them all over all over Alberta and Saskatchewan, right from downtown Lloydminster. One of the towers is still there, the tower that's on top of the uptown apartment block, uh, right across from the CKSA radio station. There's a tower on top of a building there, and uh, without engineering, without any plans of any sort, I built that tower on top of that building, and it's been there since uh, probably 1978. And uh, it's still there. It's got antennas hung all over it. And uh, and I put that tower up. And I built another one on the east side of Lloyd. I built them on Mount Joy. I built them on Moose Mountain and Bonneville. I built them Kindersley. I built them all over. One day, Bill comes to me and says, Wayne, he says, I've got no more towers to build. What are you going to do now? I says, well, I don't know, Bill. I says, I kind of enjoy this communication work. He says, well, I'll tell you what. If He, he says, can you sell? And I says, I don't know. Uh, well, I, th I, I think I can. He says, well, go out and sell radios. And I says, I don't know anything about two-way radio communication. Or, and he says, well, he says, start selling farmers because they don't know anything about it either, he says. So, <laughs> so I started selling. I, I says, and he says, I'll pay you 10% commission on everything anything on sell. anything you sell. So I said, well, there's, there's an opportunity. So I had to provide my own beat-up truck. I had an old blue GMC beat-up truck. And, uh, and, uh, I went out, started selling two way radios and I, and I learned and, and it was a, it was a great job because no one else was doing it. It was a great opportunity. And there were some months I would sell 20 or $25,000 worth of equipment in, in, in a month. And, uh, and, uh, Bill, Bill, you know, he was growing his business and, uh, he was just loving my efforts out there. I, and I went hard at it. And I traveled all the way from Kindersley down into Oyen over to, to Camrose and up to Coal Lake and all, all around the country. And I got into selling not only farmers, but selling uh, municipal governments and because and, they were getting radio communications and selling hospital paging systems and oil companies and, and really grew the business. Eh? And, uh, and uh, one, you know, then there's a downturn in the there's a downturn in the late 70s early 80s and the radio communication fell off and so i moved on but bill bill till was very grateful on on the effort that i put in to help him grow his business as a matter of fact uh it, it'd probably be 10 years ago now bill stopped me on the street one day and i said bill how are you doing anyway oh a great wayne he says he says wayne he says i just want to thank you and i says bill thank me for what what, what have i done he says, I want to thank you for all the hard work that you put in to helping us grow our business. He says, we never would have done as well as we did because he sold out by that time to Motorola. He says, we never would have grown that business like we did without, without you being, being in, in sales. Okay? So, 
So that was really a great gratitude. I'll, and I'll never forget that, that comment that he made. So it slowed down. And, and I was a five-year man at that time. You know, it seems like I was working a job for five years and then move on to do something different, you know, kind of thing. And so I went from, from selling two radios and I went to work for a trucking company in Lloydminster called Lloydminster Heavy Crude and, uh, and started there. I didn't know much about trucking, but I, I was uh, in sales and promoting the trucking company I was working for. And then I moved into into uh, management, and I was I I I took over the assistant managing of of the of the company. We had we had a depot in Elk Point, uh, Alberta. Uh, we had Lloyd Minster. We had trucks scattered around the country doing you know pressure trucks and vacuum trucks and fluid hauling trucks and that and that sort of thing. All petroleum industry. And I recognized some some of the jobs I was having to send my man into with a trucking company, some of the jobs on tank cleaning, some of the jobs on uh, dealing with, with settled solids at the time, because the industry was just changing from the way they produced our heavy oil here. At, at one point in time, all we had was the old pump jack, the stroking type of pump jack. And, and, and they were running very slowly because the oil is so thick and heavy and solids and so on. And, uh, at the time, they were just introducing the progressive cavity pump, which is the screw pump, the rotating screw pump. It was intended to to pump solids rather than leaving the solids in the well bore, pump the solids to the surface, have them accumulate in the tank, and, and, then, so you, and then remove them, and then as soon as you clean your well bore out. And so I was all part of that. And uh, I was having to send my men into really nasty conditions when it comes to tank cleaning. And so... I was watching all this going on. I was I hated sending my men in into those tanks, and so then it came to me that, geez, maybe there's better ways to to clean tanks, and uh, and uh, with my farming background, I remember us using augers for cleaning grain bins, and and uh, augers would move, you know, lumpy type frozen grain. It would move. Uh, uh, almost water, you know, and so on. So I thought to myself, geez, maybe we can use augers to uh, to come up with a system. Well, the, my boss at the time wasn't interested in taking on a, a long-term project like that. And so I decided that I would, uh, I, I would take on this project. There was no technology like it out there. I decided I would try to build a prototype of a machine to see if I could make this work and uh, come up. And, and actually, I went to see a fellow in, in Elk Point. His, uh, his name was Graphica. Hans Rohner was his name, Graphica Arts. And he was quite knowledgeable on, on, uh, on, on how to deal with government lending agencies and, and so on. Because my intention was to come up with money. I, I needed to, although I had a little bit of money by this time, because of Till Communications, uh, I had some money. And... Uh, and I went to the to the government and asked them for some for some uh, funding for a for a project that I had. And uh, and and uh, so we did some drawings. I've still got the drawing to this day, and the presentation that I made to the government. And what I was after was a, was fifty thousand dollars to build a prototype, what what I called a grit hog machine, so that we could clean tanks without digging a hole in the ground, uh, environmentally friendly. And without having any men enter the tank or enter the confined space, that was very hazardous. So th that was my that was my intention. So we started uh, uh, design work, uh, you know, because I had no money yet. And then the government come back. It took me two years, but the government came back. Uh, Bud Miller was our local MLA, and uh, he he came back one day. I went to see him. I says, you know, after two years, I was getting kind of fed up with it all. And and I and I I had a show and tell at at the Lloyd Minster Heavy Crude shop. I invited a lot of oil company people there. I invited Bud Miller there to give them a presentation as to how I thought this thing would, could work. And I'd actually built a small scale prototype that I could actually shovel in oily sand and have it auger. It was just a, a, a prototype machine, and it worked. And uh, after that meeting. Bud Miller was was you know he was friendly at the meeting, 
But as he walked away, I followed him out to the parking lot. And I says, well, bud, I says, what do you think? What do you think of my idea? Do you think the government will, will help me out with, with the development of this technology? He says, no, he says, it's just going to wear out. It's, it's not going to work. And I, and I says, bud, I says, I proved that it works. You saw that it works. No, he says, the wear, it'll wear out too quickly. It's not economic for us to invest in the project. So, so he was the MLA for Alberta, for the area. So I cussed him out. I blew a gasket on him. I used the F word several times, called him useless, freaking politician, and because I had nothing to lose at that point in time. So I just cussed him out. And I was kind of from the hard school of hard knocks, you know, oil patch type. And, uh, and, and he got into his car and I slammed the door and I walked away and that was it. I thought, oh, well, that's, that's it for that project. And, uh, the very next day he called me and he says, Wayne, he says, I've thought about this overnight. And he says, I've decided to sponsor your project. I'll give you $50,000. <laughs> so, so the, the, I, I, I had to get mean and cranky to him, but he saw how serious I was and how, how indebted I was to this project. I wasn't going to just quit. And so they, so the government came up with a $50,000 grant, forgivable grant, that, that allowed me to build the prototype machine of the Gridhog. And that was the start. And that was the start of, of the, so I, so I left Lloyd Minster Heavy Crew, I left the company and put full time into developing further machines and developing further technology of the augering technology that is that is scattered about around the world now. When you leave heavy crude, yes, are you earning an income while you're going, or you just had the fifty thousand dollar grant no, to? I I had the fifty thousand dollar grant, and I was living on my savings account. That was it. That's a ballsy move. Yep, it was, but I was dedicated, and I knew, you know, I I had big visions, and I and I thought I could make it work financially, so I I. I, I had a class five driver's license and I had, you know, I, I bought a $4,000 truck and a $2,000 trailer to haul this thing around and went out and started, you know, started and the oil, the oil companies were very supportive. They would actually give me work and very supportive of, of, of what my, my ambitions were. And, uh, and, uh, they hired me, they hired me and, and, uh, and it worked and I was able to do, you know, four and five and six, tank cleanouts a day and uh you know was sometimes they had seven eight nine ten feet of sand in these tanks eh? i was uh, able to clean them out and with nobody entering and no no muck on the ground and so that was the start and once that work got around you got extremely busy once I that see. work got around i got busier and busier and and uh came up with different ideas on 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 how to clean pits i came up with different ideas uh one idea we came up with was uh was spent catalyst uh, out of out of upgrading facilities. What spent catalyst is it's it's a it's a product that is used in the in the upgrading process of of heavy crude oil. The oil passes through this this particulate matter called catalyst that attracts the heavy metals, and so there's a continual flow of catalyst going into the process and a continuous flow of catalyst leaving the process, and and the catalyst that leaves the process is done. It's called spent catalyst. And, and it has to be transported from the, the refinery or the upgrader facility into facilities in the U.S. that extract the heavy metals from the catalyst. They process this catalyst. They extract the heavy metals. And the heavy metals are then used in the steelmaking industry. Okay? So up until that point in time, they were the industry was trucking all this catalyst from Lloydminster, from Regina, from Edmonton, Fort Saskatchewan, and so on. They were trucking it all into the recycling facilities in Freeport, Texas, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Cambridge, Ohio. That's where the recycling facilities were. So when, when I saw what was happening, I, I approached them and said, look, I can build augering apparatus and we can transport this product by rail rather than trucking all the way down. And they said, well, prove it to us. So I did. So I built them an apparatus. We could auger this catalyst. We modified rail cars so we could load this catalyst by auger into the rail cars. 
And we built an offloading apparatus that we could offload the cars in Freeport, Texas. We shipped it down and went down and installed it. We could offload. And so now, and for the last 20 years or more, all the catalyst that comes out of Canada is transported by rail, by Gridhog technology that we developed 25 or 30 years ago now. And it's all being still used to, to this day. And, and that, uh, we had to go through a, a, a certification and approvals process. Uh, we, we had to go through, uh, you know, all sorts of processes, getting the, the industry to accept this, the fact that we're transporting this, uh, this, uh, this classified as a dangerous good. So it had to be classified. And, uh, and that's still operating to this day. All the catalysts coming out of, out of Canada is transported by rail using grid hog technology for going to, into the U.S. You have a fascinating way of looking at problems. Yep. Just one thing after another. Why, why, yep. why do you, like, is it something that you're just, you're growing up with, you look at a problem, you look at something going on, and you go, why, why don't they try this? And then instead of not only saying, why don't they try this, they then pull together a application that then works. Yeah. Has that always been the case? It's always been the case. That's, that's, yeah. And, uh, I mean, the Gridhog technology, the Gridhog technology was uh, used in Albania. Uh, the Gridhog technology is used in Bakersfield, California. The Gridhog technology is used in, in other parts of, of, uh, of heavy oil in, in the Far East as well. And it's all developed here in Lloydminster. Yeah. Why Gridhog? I'm staring, you know, you look around your man cave, there's... All kinds of wild boars. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well... When, when I, I remember, you remember earlier, I mentioned a fellow by the name of Hans Rohner. Yeah. He was with Graphica. The, yes. my, my, the very first company that I went and saw that could help me come up with a proposal for the government when I, when I needed money for the, my, my initial proposal. And, and he, he told me that Wayne, he says, the most important aspect that you need to pay attention to when you start a company is the name. He says the name is the most important part of starting a new company. And, 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 and he says the name has to reflect as to what the company is all about. And, and, he, and he says, you, he says, what, how do you see your company? Well, I says the, the company is, it's, it's, it's going to be a dirty job because it's oily, it's oily waste, oily sand waste material I'm dealing with. He says, it, I, I says, it's, 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 it's going to be a dirty job the oily sand waste is heavy and hard to handle. The oily sand waste is very plentiful, and and uh, and and it's very it's gritty. It's sand. It's grit. And and I says, so so I said, you know, Hans. I said, you know, a pig is is renowned to being very tough, uh, very durable, uh, works under all kinds of extreme conditions, lives in extreme conditions. And so, so a hog is, 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 is something that, that would kind of fit here. And, and it's gritty type material. So it says grit hog would, would, would maybe, maybe be a logical choice of name. And he thought about it. He says, yeah. He says a grit hog would, would, be, would suit this application uh, very well. So he came up with the name grit hog before, as, as part of our initial presentation, we came up with grit hog as, as, as a name. And that name has stuck with us for over 35 years now. Everything's grit hog. Here I thought and maybe then, you had a, a boar out in the wild. And <laughs> yeah, no, no. And then and then one thing led to another with, with the trucking company that I had going and all the employees I had and the equipment I had. And then we started getting into manufacturing because part of, of grit hog and the trucking company was manufacturing for International Catalyst, for example, that rail company. For, part of my company turned into manufacturing and then, then it was a suggestion that we break the manufacturing away from the trucking company, and that's where Grit Industries came, came up with. We had Grit Hog being Sand Control Systems Limited, which is my, the, uh, the initial main company, and then it had Grit Industries, which was the manufacturing company. And then it had A Fire Burner Systems, and then it had Cold Weather Technologies, which was a new technology, the heating technology that we developed and we had other companies as well. You, you, uh, you were telling me earlier that you looked at, you know, when you can't beat them, you join them, and you go, you'd go buy a company and, and bring them in. Mm -hmm. When you were evaluating different 
uh, industries, companies, whatever you want to call it. What what were you looking for? What what was sticking out to you? Well, I was I was very interested and very heavily reliant on the heavy oil industry. The heavy oil industry, because I'm born and raised and lived in Lloydminster all my life, that's what we have here is is heavy oil. I was always looking at ways to improve the production technique of of heavy oil. I was always interested in in uh, uh, cost reduction of the of the uh, producing heavy oil, and I was always interested in finding alternative ways when it comes to safety, when it comes to improving the environment as to how we operate, and and so on. So that that's what drove me was to was to find ways to improve. Now always you know always improve things. Now heavy oil as you know, is, is cyclical. It's, it's very up and down, reliant on world markets and, and so on. And, and I wasn't, I, I tried not to be solely reliant on just heavy oil. I, I needed to move, uh, to move away because of the ups and downs. If, if you're familiar with heavy oil, I mean, you remember in the mid 80s, there was a real downturn. That's when I started my company was in the mid 80s. I started it in, in the middle of a downturn. And that taught me a lot to be frugal, to be, uh, you know, have a have a reserve. Unlike when I was traveling the world, I always wanted to have a reserve when I was in business, and uh, and uh, and not be reliant on always just one. So I was I tried to be diverse. I diversified from cleaning of production tanks to cleaning of pits to to uh, transporting spent catalysts by rail using grid auger you know augering technology. I I tried to build heating systems for heavy oil and I diversified that into the heating systems for natural gas. And then when the natural gas heating systems showed signs of promise and 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 and, and exciting uh, application, then I moved into other opportunities which was the uh, processing of light oil and uh, moving away from heavy oil, trying to diversify into some light oil application and uh, and, and so on. And uh, and that sort of that way of thinking really worked. To be to be um, diverse is everything. Don't rely on just one thing in life. Be diverse so that if, if through no fault of your own, if if things fail, and 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 it can do through no fault of your own, that if things fail, you have another avenue to to put your efforts toward. So don't rely on just one one area of. Uh, of uh, business. Why start your business in the eighties when everything is going sideways? Well, is it just timing because you're at the right age? It was timing yeah, and timing in life is everything. Don't get me wrong. Timing is everything. But, but I saw an opportunity there. It, it had taken me years to get this, to get the government to support me on my development of, of this new technology and and timing was such that uh, that I couldn't spend several years of my life trying to get this project off the ground, and then all of a sudden, just because the, the industry was in the middle of a downturn, that that I don't proceed with the project. I uh, it's something that I just needed to do, and I was fearless, just like I just like I am today. I'm still fearless. I still do things that that some people shake their head at. But I can. But if you work at it, you can make them successful. Well, you've mentioned uh, a couple things on here, and then a couple things before we started. And fearless is a good is a good word choice. But you mentioned before we we started recording uh, your initial design for this uh, auger on on. Uh, I don't know. To me, it looks like a tractor, but uh, on a on yep. a unit that slides in and you auger it, it out this, of the tank. This uh, unit was a four wheel drive, four wheel steer. Okay, so there's the more apt way of explaining it, right? But then you talk about the regulations coming in, and now now you have containment, so the machine almost comes obsolete overnight. Yes, yes, it did, but that's exactly. But who could foresee that 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 they were going to introduce secondary containment, and uh, and uh, and and the fact was that it didn't happen overnight. It did happen over the c- course of 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 a few years. Okay, and I tried everything to 
work a, around, around that it. secondary containment, yeah. build doors, build access to the to the tank doors, do this, do this, try, try to make it work. And I just couldn't. I couldn't get industries buy-in on, on how, 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 how to do How frustrating that. was that? Oh, awfully frustrating. I put 25 years of my life into developing this technology. And through some do-gooders somewhere decided they were going to do secondary containment that it just killed the whole project. And how do you ever foresee that? You know, you know, it's, it's impossible. But look at Kodak. You know? Yeah. You know, they're a, they're a huge worldwide company. And new technology killed them. You know, so it's, that's, just, that's the price you pay for being an entrepreneur, an active entrepreneur, is that it's, that risk is the risk that you accept. Hmm. It's an ever-changing world out there. <laughs> It certainly is, and that's and, what yeah. I, uh, that's what I find very interesting about your your uh, your story is you you just you build this machine it works exceptionally well. Yep. Then the industry goes, nope, boom, we're going to do this. Which I mean, literally, yep. you're you're toast, and it happens all the time. That's why it's important to be diverse, and don't. So rely. is that what, is that is that what saves you right there? Then? Absolutely. No no question about it. Is 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 that I I had started. Be, be, because my dad told me, don't rely on just one area of expertise, be diverse. Exactly. I was looking for a way to replace fire tubes. And because fire tubes are a hazard, they're unsafe, they're inefficient, they're environmentally uh, un, unfriendly, and so on, I was looking for a way to replace fire tubes. And, and, and I was still doing grit hog work, of course. That was, that's what was funding all this, was grit hog technology. And, and so you're investing in this other side was, as you're going along. You bet, absolutely. And and I was I was looking for a way to replace fire tubes because fire tubes are hazardous, they're dangerous, they're just inefficient and 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 antique. They're they're an old technology that needs to be replaced. And now I started replacing the idea of fire tubes in 2004 is when I started. Uh, with the idea of, of, of replacing fire tubes. And and now, finally, I, I, I introduced the technology into the light oil market in North Dakota in, in about 2010, say, or maybe 2009. I went to some trade shows. I, I took our heating systems into trade shows, and I couldn't convince the government of North Dakota and the industry of North Dakota to change from fire tubes to our steam heating system that we had developed and had perfected and was now being commercialized. I couldn't convince them to change. What it took, unfortunately, what it took was a couple of the operators in North Dakota uh, ended up pulling the water out of a, out of a vessel that had a fire tube in it because in, in North Dakota, the oil is light and very volatile, and so they have to have the fire tube immersed in water. They heat the water. The water then heats the oil above it. Really? Because the oil is okay. very volatile. Yeah. By accident, they pulled the water level down. The oil level hit the fire tube, blew the tank up, or it was a vessel, blew the vessel up, killed two guys. And at that point in time, I was dealing with engineering departments and engineering groups in North Dakota, and they saw what we, what I was promoting, what I developed, and what we were doing. They saw that. They said, and I said, it re, it eliminates the the unsafe conditions that a fire tube has. We can heat that oil directly. No need to heat the water first, and then have the water heat the oil. We can heat the oil directly because it uses steam. It's not direct flame like a fire tube is. And and it took. They they tried one, and they tried another one over the course of the, of the next five or six years. And now, the company that I sold out to five years ago, they're swamped with now converting all the fire tubes into steam heating, cold weather technologies, heating systems. So, it, it, it typically what I've learned in life is that it takes 10 years from the, by the time you come up with an idea, go through the prototyping stages, the debugging of the technology and then commercializing the technology that you've developed. It takes at least 10 years to do that. And, uh, 
And I've proven this over and over. And so now, now they're, they're building heating systems for tanks. They're building heating systems for vessels. They're building heating systems for light oil, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Texas. They're all putting in the heating systems that we developed in Lloyd Minster, Alberta, Canada. They're, and they're going very hard on this. And now I'm, I'm even told that one of the technologies that, that I developed here that we couldn't sell to the Canadian Petroleum Ministry, they're now interested in that technology to eliminate the need for heating of oil in tanks altogether. And uh, they're going to flow line everything now. So, so, so it never ends. That's why you have to continually develop continually develop technology when you're in business and another thing you you hit the nail on the head with you say 10 years and all i heard was time it just takes time it just takes time yes it does but it takes 10 years yeah yeah, yeah but i mean it's nice to put ah 10 years that's gonna take 10 years but 10 years is a long ass time yeah it's funny that you just didn't scrap it and throw it in the well, back and <laughs> this is a we've lots of there's been several projects that have been Mothballed. Mothballed. Yeah, there is. But I was always able to come up with new projects, you know, that I could justify putting some time into them. And I, because I had an engineering staff, I mean, it wasn't just all me. Yeah, I, yeah, I had an yeah. engineering staff and we had, uh, of course, I had accountants looking over my shoulder all the time as to how much money I was spending on these different projects. And, uh, and uh, it just, it, what do you, it's, it's a big gamble. What do you think, Wayne, then uh, currently, uh, Climate change, global warming, you name it, they've said it. Whether or not it's true, right, it doesn't matter if you believe this or that way. At the end of the day, um, the amount of oil in the ground at some point is going to be half of what it was, a small amount of what it was. And it would just make sense that down the road you move away from this technology. Mm -hmm. Well, why, why, why is there such a, to just shut, shut it off? Uh, it's going to take time. It's going to take no time, question about it. Time to move away, and it's going to take people investing to entrepreneurs yeah. to help try and develop yeah. something. And I assume at the start, it's going to be rudimentary. It's not going to work that well, and you're going to have to continually grow and get better at it and smarter until there's a day where all of a sudden, the entire world, like you said, is now using whatever technology comes along, yeah. and it's just like, but nobody well, sees that that took twenty some years. I, I I don't I don't believe that in our lifetime that we're going to eliminate the use of petroleum products. Um, yes, we can be smarter. Um, some, for an example, some people that commute daily uh, from their from their house to downtown to their job and back to their house, those types of people could possibly use an an electric powered vehicle. Okay, um, when you get out and 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 we need to do our best to reduce the usage of of, uh, of petroleum products and to reduce emissions. But I, I don't believe that we're ever going to eliminate the petroleum industry. Uh, I, I don't believe that the electric, electric powered vehicles in Alberta and Saskatchewan, for an example, are going to be as prevalent as what they are in parts Say of California, in, uh, parts of the U S yeah. you know, cause for, for an example, we're, we're so distant, uh, you know, from point A to point B is much further uh, we've got minus 20 and 30 and 35 degree temperatures that we have to deal with. Um, uh, you know, it's, I, d I also don't believe that our electrical distribution system is up, up to the, to, power to the, the standard that we need to have yeah. to power all these vehicles. And so, so it's certainly going to take a significant amount of time. And, uh, and uh, you know, depending on who you talk to, there's lots of people that are very much in the know that are, are seriously debating whether it's the petroleum industry that is, or whether it's a cyclical issue on our climate change. There's a lot to talk about how it's just cyclical. You know, there's people talking about in 19, in 1948, for an example, the water in these lakes locally here was four feet higher than what it is today. Yeah. You know, you know, and, and, well, I always... and so there's so many variables and so much, debate as to what it is and you know that this is going to take years decades to figure out well i just when you're talking about new technologies innovative yeah. technologies technologies that have worked very very well chances are when they come along uh in the first 
sales pitch, it isn't like, oh yeah, that's brilliant. Let's do it and let's implement it everywhere. Well, no. No. Even if you get a yes, then you got to build the bloody thing. Then you got to get it to work. Yeah. Then and they're going to, okay, we'll put one over here. We'll maybe put one over there. We'll see. We'll give you another six months, right? Yeah. Or or longer. That's right. And then just to kick it in the butt and say, yeah, we're going to put it everywhere. Well, now you got to manufacture the bloody things and get them all implemented. And then, and then you got to protect that technology. I mean, I, I have patents. And and I've 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 had patents for decades, and uh, uh, it's very difficult to protect a patent, particularly in other countries. And uh, so, I mean, I've, I I hired a fellow for one example. I hired a fellow in Calgary to go to England to promote one of my technologies in England, and uh, and uh, he took he took all of my inside information, detailed technical information, went to England, and hadn't heard from him for ten years. Now, that technology is going strong in England because I didn't have patents in England. You can't patent in every little country around, around the world. It's just not economically feasible. feasible. You can't do it. You know? So that's another hardship of, of, uh, of new technology is, is to protect, you know, you'll protect your rights. Yeah. So now that technology is going strong in, in England that we developed here in Lloydminster, yeah. but it's going strong in England. Ah, it's, it's super yeah. cool. Uh, you know, you another story you told me as we walked around your place and you're showing me different things was the the natural gas uh, heater. Yes. And we don't need to get into the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah. But the story um, of basically having the government of Saskatchewan in your shop for five days and in the last two days they got nothing to do. Hey, you got anything that can work? And you build something overnight. Yeah. Very rudimentary, just so they can see it and get to play with it. <laughs> you think of how successful that's that, been. That, that to me is like that seeing, is a remarkable story. Well, then you may tell it yeah. because I, I think that, it should be captured. In 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 all my life of developing technology, that story is is a, is a premium. the The idea that I had was to diversify my company. I knew that the I was getting a lot of pressure from the heavy oil industry to uh, reduce prices, uh, uh, come up with with uh, a better technology to suit their needs because it's ever changing. And so I was diversifying my company uh, and the and the manufacturing. And so what I was trying to do was I was trying to focus on the hazards that the common fire tube. And every tank we have in heavy oil has at least one fire tube. Some have multiples. And a fire tube, what it is, is you're heating flammable liquid with a direct flame. uh, And to heat the oil, we have to heat the oil to 85 degrees C to get the oil and water to separate and the sand to drop out so as we can have pipeline spec crude oil is what the goal is uh, to truck it to refinery. And and so I I was working on it on a technology to to uh, challenge the fire tube uh, technology, and come up with a system without getting into too much detail. Coming up with a system that created steam under vacuum, and be, because all these sites that we have in the petroleum industry are quite remote, and the majority of them don't have electricity on site, I needed to develop a technology that was that was. Uh, safe and efficient and you know clean burning environmentally um, would would burn either propane or natural gas or wellhead gas so it had to be flexible that way it there's most often there's no electricity on site so it couldn't have electric motors and electric uh, pumps and and electric controls it had to have millivolt controls that were able to be created from a from a flame and, uh, and so on. So that was the criteria that I had. Well, I, I developed a technology that we call uh, a heat-driven loop. And what it is, is it creates steam under vacuum. And, uh, and uh, I, in the event of a, of a failure, equipment failure or, or so on, we needed to have a glycol water mixture so as it wouldn't freeze if, if the unit went down. So we, we had a system, a, a closed system operating on vacuum, and the maximum vacuum that that you can achieve is 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 about 30, 30 inches of water column or around thirty. We could we could get twenty minus twenty six or minus twenty eight uh, reasonably easy, 
and and it was a closed system that maintained at minus 26 or minus 28. When you have a, a system that's operating on vacuum and you boil water, water will boil at roughly 40 degrees uh, Celsius on, on vacuum. Okay, so it has a very low boiling. Water typically boils at 100, right, in, in, uh, at sea level, and it'll boil at about 40, 40 degrees. So the beauty of that is that water boils very quickly. When you heat water to 40 degrees, it'll turn to steam. The steam will expand a thousand times its volume, roar off out of the boiler system into the heat exchanger, transfer its heat, and then condense back to water and flow by gravity back to the boiler. Hits that hot bed of glycol, flashes back to steam, so it's cyclic, very quickly cycles and so on. Well, that's the way the system works. And and I couldn't sell, uh, because of the 10-year term it takes to get in industry interested in, in new technology, I uh, couldn't uh, hit it off r real well with the heavy oil production group. So so then I bought a company by the name of A-Fire Burner Systems and decided if you can't beat them, join them. We started manufacturing uh, naturally drafted fire tube burners. Well, along came Sask Energy one day. They had knew that I had bought A-Fire Burner Systems and Sask Energy came along and asked me one day, so Wayne, he says, I understand you bought a fire burner systems, which is, was a local Lloydminster company. He says, we want to, we use a fire on some of our natural gas line heaters. And, and, uh, we, we want to once and for all standardize. So as all of our natural gas line heaters in the province have the same, uh, have the same technology. So that our, our service people are familiar with the technology. And I said to them, I says, well, geez, what does a natural gas line heater do in the in natural gas distribution? And 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 they and they said, well, what it does is that when you have high pressure natural gas being transferred in high pressure natural gas pipelines, it's typically at a thousand or maybe even twelve hundred pounds pressure. Before the gas enters the community, um, the pressure's dropped at the edge of town to sixty pounds pressure, and then before it enters your home it's reduced to two ounces by a regulator out on the back of your home. And said, when you reduce the pressure of a gas, for every 100 pounds of pressure you drop, you lose seven degrees Fahrenheit of temperature, which is called the Joules-Thompson effect. And because the natural gas in the high pressure natural gas pipelines has, has been transferred thousands of miles, perhaps, underground, the natural gas is at ground temperature. And when the pressure's dropped, for every 100 pounds of pressure you drop, you lose 7 degrees Fahrenheit of temperature. So when you're going from 1,000 PSI, for easy figuring, to, to 60 PSI, you're losing about 75 degrees of temperature. So you can't transfer natural gas at minus 75. Obviously, you'll freeze the roadways, crossings, you'll freeze the lawns, you'll freeze the, uh, you know, the countryside. So you have to heat the gas where the pressure is dropped. So there's what's called a natural gas line heater there. And the old technology would typically use a naturally drafted fire tube burner, a tank, a horizontal tank full of glycol. And inside in the glycol would be a, a, a high pressure gas pipeline that would take the heat and act as a heat exchanger. And they, they said that when they, they asked me, they said, geez, you know, you bought a fire. We like a fire burner systems. We want to once and for all standardize for ease of, of uh, field repair and, and field maintenance, we're going to bring SAS Saskatchewan Research Council in and we're going to do some testing on which is the most uh, uh, high performance uh, system available on the market today. We're going to test glycols, we're going to test burner systems and so on to see which we should standardize on. And, and I said, sure, yeah, c come on in. I've, I've, I've got a vacant shop from another project that I've, that I've had going on, I'm waiting for, I've got a vacant shop. You can come in and use that shop and uh, all for free. So they came to Lloydminster. They moved into the shop on a Monday morning. They had, they had five days planned with Saskatchewan Research Council to do their testing of glycols, of heat transfer, of, of um, uh, you know, efficiencies of burners and so on. And uh, they started and they went along and everything was ticking along and 
two, Monday was done and then Tuesday was done and Wednesday was done and they were they come to be Wednesday morning and said, geez, Wayne, we're, things are going along quicker than what we had planned and it looks like we're going to be done sooner. We, you know, we're going to be done maybe Wednesday afternoon and we've got nothing to do on Thursday and Friday. He says, you've been watching us. Have you got anything else that might work in this application? And I said, you know, I've been watching, you know, for the last three days and, and I think I might have. Uh, you know, a, a new technology I've been working on. And the technology is what I call a heat-driven loop. It's a system that does not require electricity, has no moving parts, is very safe and efficient, uh, uses natural gas as an energy source, does not require electricity, and so on. And they says, well, good, well, let's get one of these things together so as we can test it tomorrow. And I says, holy. I says, I don't have a natural gas line here to test. But I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll put together... Uh, my welding staff and my fabricating people and we'll see what we can do for tomorrow. So, you know, I recognize this as an opportunity and so I, I had my staff work all night long putting together some, you know, using some used equipment we had and some used heaters and so on and by the next morning we come up with this, this really rudimentary, uh, simplistic, ugly looking thing that was not painted, not insulated, no control system. It was just awful looking and they looked at it and they, <laughs> I could just see them shaking their head in disgust and, and, uh, and we're questioning, you know, you know, the whole technology. Well, we, we, we hooked it up and the, the control system we had was, uh, was, well, there wasn't a control system. It was me standing beside the heater the uh, Robert Shaw gas valve switch and the guy from the Saskatchewan Research Council would look at me and wave and I'd turn it on and he'd be watching his gauges and, and, and thermometers, line thermometers and so on. And he'd wave at me and I'd turn it off and he, cycling this, this air through this line and watching the temperature rise and, and so on. And uh, then after a short while, he waved at me in disgust it looked like he said shut her down shut her down he says something's wrong here we're we're running at 85 percent overall thermal efficiency and the best we could achieve the last three days was 30 to 35 percent with the natural gas fire tube he says there's something wrong here we've got some uh, some malfunctioning equipment so they checked their computers and they checked their sensors and checked everything all over and waved at me again and i turned it on and they were watching and i was watching and I could just see the excitement on all of those high-tech engineers and from Saskatchewan Research Council and the Sask Energy guys were over there looking and I could just see the excitement going on. And they looked, looked over and shut her down, shut her down. So I shut it down and they said, you know what? We've got a miracle happening here. This is, this is almost triple the efficiency that we, that we had in the previous three days. Uh, you know, what, where do we go from here? So I said, well, we, we can build some prototypes that are insulated and cladded and, and uh, have you know the, the best of uh, control equipment and so on and put them out in the field. And, they, and so that was the start. That was the start of, of how we discovered an application for the technology that I thought was, was on the way out for the heating of, of heavy oil. That was the start. And uh, at the, that day, or even the very next day, the management of Sask Energy come to me and said that they wanted to do an alliance partnership on the development of this natural gas line heating technology. And uh, this is the this is the head office in in Regina. They invited us down there. We went down and we became best of friends over the years. And today, that's all Sask Energy uses is is the cold weather technologies natural gas line heaters. The technology has spread now into Alberta, into British Columbia, into California, all through the U.S. As a matter of fact, there's a, now a manufacturing facility in Florida that all they build is cold weather technologies, heating systems for light oil and for natural gas distribution. They've also all throughout Toronto uh, area, all of Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and so on. So, so that's just how, how you call it lucky, but it's, it's just strategically, that's what you plan for is, is an opportunity comes along. You got to jump at it and, uh, and do your best to try to make it work, make changes. Uh, yes, absolutely. 
the first one, uh, we made a lot of changes from the first, with the help of Sask Energy and the Saskatchewan Research Council as well. So that's, that's one of these success stories. And uh, because that diversified my company, the, the people that were familiar, most familiar with the technology and uh, the, the, uh, the companies that use the technology, they're, they're sold and they're faithful and, and there's no competition in, in that market at all. So it's, it's been a very good uh, development project for us. Well, after that story, that's a fantastic yeah. story. And I just, I can't get over, you You got to recognize opportunity, obviously. But they say, uh, you know, you got something else for us. Well, maybe. Well, we need it tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> well, I'll see what I can do. Well, and you work 24 you, hours you, straight to put in something that you got, everybody's laughing yeah. at. But who cares? Yeah. I mean, you recognize the opportunity of, I got these guys sitting here. They got time. They're actually going to use it, and maybe there's something here that we can do that can just lock it in. Oh, it was was a miracle. It really was. That was was in my life, uh, uh, you know, just simply a miracle, that how how it all evolved really was. It's amazing. Well, I don't know how, I don't know where to go from there, Wayne. This has been highly enjoyable. Uh, uh, We're going on, I don't know, hour and a half, hour and change. Um, is there anything else that you want to bring up? I know we've talked a lot about your company, uh, a lot about your younger years, a little bit about your traveling. Uh, is there anything else that you want to discuss? Well, well, I guess when, when you're in, in a, a person of my position or my mentality, you know, I'm probably going to work until the day that I die. And, uh, and I'm always looking for opportunities um, uh, I do volunteer work now, a lot of volunteer work for the Sandy Beach Regional Park. Uh, the, you know, I'm a doer. Something comes up that needs to be done while well, they look at me and I get out there and do it. You know, that's just nature, nature of the beast. The, uh, I've been very lucky to have the people that I've worked with, my employees. Um, I was always one first guy at the office in the morning, uh, seeing everybody off to their field jobs and positions and then the last guy at night to leave and to welcome everybody in. And, and all those employees, they became my best friends. Um, they're still employees, but they were my best friends. And, and to this day, I, I have people walking up to me on the, on the street and thanking me for, for, uh, you know, helping them out. I, I was a very firm believer in the trades. Um, I'm a firm believer in sponsoring, uh, the, employees to get training and to get certification in the trades uh, electricians uh, gas fitters uh, welders and 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 design folk and so on I sponsor all those people and uh, and, and also I've been a, a firm believer and I think it really helps with the with the lo- local perception of your company is if, if you help uh, from a community standpoint, um, I've, I've always been a firm believer in sponsoring, uh, good charities. Um, you know, for, for an example, the, the, uh, Thorpe recovery center in Lloydminster, it, it helps people that are in distress and people that need help. That's, that's what their job is. And, and I've always been a big supporter of the Thorpe. I've been a big supporter of the, of the, uh, uh, the community college, for an example, sponsored several of the of the laboratories and, and shops and so on. I've been a big sponsor of the Boys and Girls Club of North Battleford. You know, and, and I'm talking, you know, I'm, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars that we've been able to, because we've been financially solid, we've been able to support them. And, uh, and, and I, I receive a lot of gratitude from, from the local communities for that, for that. And that's what, that's what you work for, you know, is to help out the, the, the community. Really, that's what you work for. The employees and the and the community is is the most important in my eyes to any any company. Hmm. Well, uh, I don't know where to go yeah. from there. That's yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. I, I appreciate Wayne you coming on and sharing a bit about uh, your journey yeah. and and some stories from it. Uh, and there's lots more that we never touched on. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we've we've hit the highlights. Well, I appreciate it, yeah. Wayne. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for letting yeah. me come and one, pick your brain. One, one, one last story. One last story. 
when when the industry changed to uh, the petroleum industry changed to having uh, environmental secondary containment around oil tanks. So every above ground oil tank has to have a secondary containment system right. around it for spill in the event of a spill. So so that outdated my grid hog machine technology. But if you can't beat them, join them. I started manufacturing secondary containment, thinking there's a big market. It's it's a good it's a good product to manufacture. It's repetitive and so on. So I started manufacturing. We come up with the design. We started manufacturing that technology, and in order to do it more efficiently, I put in or I I I researched a what's called a roll forming machine, and what what that machine is is you buy the raw material in big coils, thirty thousand pound coils, and this machine. You rolls it out. Rolls it out. It processes this this sheet metal that comes in a coil, punches holes, makes bends, makes cuts, and so on to make the panels that we use for secondary containment. So, so we were building them by hand, and then I got the idea we needed to put in a roll forming machine. So I inquired about North America, and the machine was going to cost me one point eight million dollars to buy this one machine to roll form secondary containment panels. So I thought to myself, well, to be uh, honorable to Canadians, I thought, well, I would try to have it built in Canada. So I went to Toronto, researched Toronto, found one company in Toronto that could build this machine for me. And it was going to cost me $1.8 million and it was going to be a 12 month delivery. And they needed $600,000 as a down payment to get started. Eh? So, so we did a deal, uh, gave them $600,000. It was going to be a 12 month delivery. I kept in contact with them. And how I did that, I would fly to Toronto. I'd leave Lloyd Minster at 3 o'clock in the morning, catch a 6 o'clock flight out of Edmonton, fly to Toronto, get to Toronto by noon, Toronto time. I would tour their shop, visit, get back on the plane by 5 o'clock Toronto time, get back to Edmonton, drive home, get back at midnight, and I'd be at work the next morning. I mean, that, that's how I was checking on me. And uh, a year come and gone, the machine wasn't done. And I said, look, you guys, what's going on? Well, we underbid it. We need more money. By that time, I'd give them just under a million dollars by that time. And the machine wasn't done. So how much more money do you need? I asked them, well, we need another 400000 to finish the machine off. So I, and what do you do? They, they had me. So I had to pay them an extra four hundred grand, and And then they said it's going to be six more months. So five months came. I was checking on them. Six months came, came and went. The machine wasn't done. So, so then I went down to Toronto, I flew down there, kind of cranky, walked into the shop, started taking pictures, and the owner of, 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 this, uh, of, of this place, uh, he, he came out and he seen me taking pictures because I knew I was going to get into the courts and I was going to try to get that machine out of there so as I could finish it ourselves back here in, in Alberta. So he seen me taking pictures, he knew what I was doing, he came at me, he run at me, and he was not a big guy. You know, I'm fairly big. He came at me, run at me. So I, I, I didn't punch him, but I grabbed him and threw him on the floor, threw him down. And, uh, and uh, then all of a sudden the police showed up. So the police showed up. He was, he was messed up. And so they arrested me and uh, put me in jail in, in Toronto. And they arrested him too, though. So they arrested both of us. And, and, and so I was in jail in Toronto. Uh, just for the afternoon, and then I promised them I would behave, and so they let me go. And I got back to Lloyd Minster here, and got the and got the courts involved. I got a court order to get the machine out of out of his facility. We loaded the machine up. I went back down. We loaded the machine up, transported it to Lloyd Minster, and finished it ourselves. And uh, and so that's how things can go sometimes. <laughs> finished it ourselves. The machine's still working to this day. Okay. So that's how things can go sometimes. The best planning sometimes uh, doesn't work out as planned. <laughs> that was one of the only time I've ever been in jail. I want you to know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's that is one. Yeah. That's a ride. Yeah, yeah, that was quite a story. Anyway, well, thanks again yeah. for inviting me out here, and yeah. uh, really enjoyed sitting down okay. with you. Wayne. Well, I hope you can. Uh, yeah, ho hope you like my information. It's. It's uh, it's been quite a life that I've led. Absolutely, no, no well, doubt. Well, so, thanks again. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Hey, folks! Thanks for joining us today.
If you just stumbled on the show, please click subscribe. Then scroll to the bottom and rate and leave a review. I promise it helps. Remember, every Monday and Wednesday, we will have a new guest sitting down to share their story. The Sean Newman Podcast is available for free on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you get your podcast fix. Until next time. Hey, Caners. You can uh, you can hear in the background what tomorrow is going to bring. Tomorrow is going to bring the round table, and uh, it was a rather heated spectacle. There was a few extra bodies in the room, and we had a lot of fun, and uh, I hope you tune in tomorrow for Monday, uh, Brothers Roundtable playoff preview. It's a, it's a lot of fun, and they're all staring at me right now why I'm doing this while they're talking. Well, you kind of get a feel for what's coming for tomorrow. And if you're the champ, I assume uh, you'll be at work tomorrow, but who knows? Maybe you're taking a, a, a leave of absence to, to swing those clubs, all right? We'll catch the rest of you Monday. Have a great one, guys, and uh, like I say, catch up to you tomorrow.